Podcastle, episode 828, for Tuesday the 27th of February, 2024. The Museum of Living Colour, by Ryan Cole. Read by Hugo Jackson, and produced by Eric Valdez. Rated PG-13. Good morning, good day, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to Podcast on the Flying Castle of Fantasy Fiction. I'm your host, Matt Dovey, and it's my particular pleasure to present for your enjoyment the Museum of Living Colour by our own Ryan Cole, narrated by Hugo Jackson. This story was first published in May 2023 in the anthology Museum Piece from Metaphoricist Publishing. Before we get into it, a swift and timely reminder. We are open to general submissions from 1st of March through the end of the month. Usual rules apply, so if you've sent in something before, you know what to do. If you haven't, and you want to know more, your first port of call is our submissions guidelines on our website at podcastle.org, where you'll find the specific bounds of what we're after and how the process actually works. As ever, the three most important rules are Don't submit god-awful, racist, sexist, ableist nonsense. You should know by now, that's not us. Secondly, Fantasy is a broad church, and if you need to sort of squint and look sideways before a story looks like fantasy, that's still good enough. Send it in. And lastly, don't self-reject. We are here to read stories. That is what we want to do. The worst that happens is we say no and you get another chance next time. You've got until the end of March 31st UK time to submit, and the earlier you submit, the more chances you have to send in another. So please do give it a go. Today's author is Ryan Cole, a speculative fiction writer who lives in Virginia with his husband and snuggly pug child. He is a winner of the Writers of the Future contest and his recent work has appeared, or is forthcoming, in Clark's World, Metastella, Voyage YA by Uncharted, Gallery of Curiosities and the Bram Stoker Award nominated anthology Mother, Tales of Love and Terror from Weird Little Worlds Press. Find him at ryancolewrites.com and on Twitter at ryancolewrites. Hugo Jackson is an author and streamer on the east coast of the USA. Born in the UK, they moved to the US to be with their partner and have since published the first three novels of a five-book young adult fantasy series, The Resonance Tetralogy, through Inspired Quill. They also stream semi-regularly on Twitch, username Pangolin Fox, and run a yearly charity stream on World Pangolin Day to raise money for one of their favourite animals, the aforementioned pangolin. And now pay attention. For our tale is about to begin, and maybe it's time to change the way it's told. The Museum of Living Colour by Ryan Cole, narrated by Hugo Jackson. Red lust, as usual, comes in the morning. Red in the way that you whisper my name, in the tender caress of your fingers on my neck, where my dry skin soaks up your technicolor world. Where you are my brush, and I am your canvas, pliant, eager, ready to be drawn. I smile as your scorched earth skin comes to life. I swallow the vermilion heat on your tongue. And I take, I steal as much of you as I can. But it's never enough. Not for me or your family, or the portrait of us that they want you to create. The one that will hang in their gallery forever. And you and I both know that your red never lasts. Revised placard text for The Portrait of Maurice and Henrietta Mildren, 1925, Great Falls, Virginia, property of the Mildren Family Gallery. Maurice and Henrietta are pictured along with their six children on the Azalea Garden lawn of the Mildren family estate. As is shown by the way that they gaze into each other's eyes, red played a prominent role in the artists' lives. Note the crimson undertones, the unabashed desire. Red lust is used to hide all of their flaws. Note also, however, the smear on Henrietta's chin, the dark golden anger, the same gold that glimmers in Maurice's right pupil. The artists claimed that these were due to the aging of the portrait and that they would never have used such an impure colour, especially gold, to paint themselves. Mrs. Henrietta Mildren, the original curator of this gallery, took pride in showing which colours made an appropriate marriage, and until her recent death, that marriage, and its portrait, was what every Mildren relative strove to achieve. 
gold creeps in like the sun between the clouds. Your lust becomes a shadow of the fire that it was when you sculpted my skin with red smeared hands. When you hadn't yet dipped into your palette of emotions, the reminders of who you are and who you have to be, who we have to be, to have a place in your family. I don't think we should go, you say through your tie. You wrangle the ends into a paisley knot around your throat. You're still not ready. I'm not ready, I say, unsurprised, because I am no stranger to your swiftly changing colours, the inconvenient shades that you aren't allowed to show. It's been seven years. I've learned what I need to know. Maybe it's not enough. I pull on my loafers, absorbing the words. Your gold never comes without a fine, serrated edge, forged in the heat of your growing frustration. At me. At your parents. Your bottled-up emotions. I'm as ready as I'll ever be, I say, with years of practice. You sigh and rest the back of your hand on my cheek, staining me with all of your dark, dirty gold. One of the scant few colours you can share. Alfie, you whisper. Don't make me do this. I try to pull away, but the colour won't let me. It continues to flow. You can't just cancel, I say, my cheek burning. We've had this scheduled for months. As if there weren't anything strange about scheduling an appointment to see your great aunt, whom you've known since you were a child, who has probably already seen what you're trying to hide. Don't blame me for showing you who you really are. But since when did the canvas give advice to the brush? We're going, I say. She even purchased our portrait frame. You pucker your lips into an irritated pout, and you let your colour slide all the way down my back, under my blazer, where nobody can see. My canvas skin shivers. I drink in the anger that you feel, but don't want to. A piece of yourself that you would rather not own. And, like a good husband, I let it all in. I let it seep into the wrinkles in my stomach, the folds in my thighs that your scarlet self adores. I stow it in my armpits under my toenails. Tiny pieces slip under the flaps of my eyelids, so that when I go to sleep, my vision is a black field with bright, golden stars. But that doesn't matter. You don't need to hide from me. The one we have to fool is your great-aunt Susanna, and I'm starting to worry that you may be right. Are the two of us prepared to join the Mildren family gallery? Revised placard text for The Portrait of Malachi and Joanne Mildren, 1939, Richmond, Virginia, property of the Mildren Family Gallery. Malachi Mildren, the youngest of Maurice and Henrietta's six children, is pictured with his betrothed, the smiling Joanne Mildren, who is seven months pregnant. When the artists finish painting their official self-portrait, an act often saved for several years into a marriage, they had only been engaged for two and a half months. Note the pale yellow angst, the silhouette of displeasure that surrounds both their shoulders. It is worth noting that their union was one of necessity, a product of Mrs. Henrietta Mildren, who disapproved of the artist's premarital activities. Which begs the question, was Joanne's smile genuine? Dots of faded yellow trickle from you in a haze as we step out of the car and onto the driveway. Your unruly blonde curls slicked into submission, cast you as a man that I don't normally see, tamed, dampened, willing to suffer the necktie that binds you. We walk past the fountain, up the granite steps that fan out in waves, and we stand on the threshold of a door that dwarfs us. It morphs into turrets and stained glass windows and balconies that overlook a garden of azaleas. Your fingers scrape mine, but they aren't really there. They vanish, brushless into what we haven't achieved, into how you haven't shaped us into what we should be. You simmer into your worries, and I simmer with you. You knock on the door, and you cringe when it opens. My little maverick, says Susanna, who is almost three times your age, pinching her over-plump lips into a smile. She inspects you like I do when you aren't paying attention, searching for a shade that you haven't shown before, as if she knows that what we've crafted isn't worthy of display. Then she squeezes my shoulder with a splotchy, brittle hand, betraying a strength that her thin frame hides. 
And Alfie, my dear, it's been far too long. I haven't seen you since the wedding. I'm so glad you're here. Commissioning a portrait is a Mildred family tradition, and you're the first couple that I get to sink my teeth into. She grins, veneers flashing, and she guides us inside. You hesitate, afraid to walk into the building that will commemorate our marriage for generations to come. And like a fading ray of sunlight, you cling to the wall, hover by the portraits that are hanging in the entryway. There is one in particular that captures your interest. Ah, says Susanna, shuffling over. There's your Aunt Melanie, back when she was pretty. And you, cute as a button. She points at a much younger version of yourself, clothed only in the colours that the gallery condones. But come on over here, take a look at this one. She guides us to the other side of the sprawling foyer, where an oversized portrait hangs over the staircase. See that one there, right over the banister? That's your great-uncle Milton and his wife Genevieve. This gets your attention. Is that one new? Oh, you know Henrietta, always hiding things away. I found it down in the basement in an unmarked crate, and once I knew you were coming, I chose to dust it off. It looks different than the others, doesn't it? You say. More erratic, you mean. Showing all the wrong colours. But you leave that unsaid. Each of us is unique, says Susanna, smiling coyly. She leaves us at that, doesn't wait for you to answer. The two of us shuffle from the chandelier foyer, leaving you alone with your long-dead relatives, and with a wrinkled hand on my waist, your great-aunt guides me into a cavernous sitting room where a tray of miniature sandwiches and teacups is arranged, along with a large, empty square of oiled wood. Is this ours? I say. Susanna nods with me. The empty frame rests grandly on an easel, and not just any frame, the frame to officiate our place in the Mildred family. It's beautiful, I say, because truly it is. A masterwork of cedar planks, intricately carved. My eyes start to glisten, but I cannot cry. Not near Susanna. When I cry, I lose control. My canvas unfurls. The colours that you give me escape in all directions. They emerge from my dozens of carefully crafted hideaways. My wrinkles, my eyelids, the crease between my shoulder blades. And maybe it's the stress or the guilt from our lies, but the teardrops that flow start to crack my facade. Alfie, what's wrong, dear? Says Susanna, her voice smooth. Come over here, sit with me. I follow the trail of her hand to the sofa because it's already too late. Our secret is revealed. Miss Susanna, I say, I I apologize, really. I I, I don't know what's come over me. Well, I do, she says, wiping my cheek. And you can call me Suze. I'm not like my mother. You do? I croak. She nods, her fingers dyed a burnt, rusty gold as she soaks up my color. Maverick needs to accept that nobody is perfect. Not you. Not me, not him, not even them. She says that last with a sweep of her arms to encompass all the portraits on the walls around us. I wonder what secrets that sentence could hold. But she doesn't elaborate. She taps me on the knee and motions to the foyer. Why don't you try to get Mav to come in here? The gallery has some new rules that I've created and I think he'll want to hear them. Another coy smile, knowing more than she lets on. I leave her on the sofa and I find you standing right where we left you before. Your arms are crossed. Eyes on the portrait of your great-uncle Milton, the one that, until now, no one knew existed. On the gold, flowing out of his oil-sketched features. The gold, so similar to what you repress, to what you've been taught isn't clean, isn't right. And around that gold, a hint of hopeful green, and a midnight blue sadness that looks nearly black. Revised placard text for The Portrait of Hugo and Melanie Mildren, 1966 Great Falls, Virginia, property of the Mildren Family Gallery. Hugo and Melanie are pictured in the conservatory of the Mildren Family Estate. They are joined by Maverick, their newly adopted nephew, aged three years old on the date of commission. Only six months after the tragic passing of his parents, the late Beatrice Mildren and her husband Murphy. Hugo and Melanie are blatant in their optimism. Note the dandelion stems that dangle from their fingers, the effervescent turquoise that bubbles from their lips, the wilderness of two happy weeds at their feet. 
The promise of rebirth, a commendable theme, is strong in this rendition. Green hope drowns out their sordid blue past. Of particular importance, these artists were prone to feeling a wide range of emotions, the command of which, some would say, was less than ironclad, and which, for better or worse, they passed down to their children. As you emerge from your reverie, you touch my arm and say, Alfie, I'm sorry. I'm sorry too. I'm sorry that your parents didn't teach you restraint to summon one colour when you don't need them all. But then again, those colours are what drew us together. It's all right, Mav, I say. Our portrait will be the most spectacular one of them all. You smile at my smile. You allow yourself to relax. The golden anger fizzles to a cool, plain white as fresh as new soil, complacent and tired from the storm of emotion. And out of that soil springs a leaf and a stem. A hopeful bud of green wiggles out from your eyebrow, another from the curlicue swirl in your ear. I allow them to blossom. You smell of crisp spearmint and rosemary thistle. You sparkle like a newly chiseled emerald jewel. And the green flows freely into my canvas, brimming with all of the innocent positivity that your childhood self on the wall exudes. This is one color that I gladly soak up. This portrait of Milton, you say, your voice shaking. It's what I wanted us to be, but he's so sloppy. His colors bleed everywhere. You turn your eyes inward, not thinking of Milton. Mav, I say quickly, reaching through your storm, the green so wild that it doesn't let me through. Susanna said it's okay, that we don't need to hide it anymore. But you're already lost. The green is too fragile. Your emerald retracts, compounding on itself, and with all of the pressure that comes with too much hope, it shatters. I'm going to take a walk, you say, pulling away. You let go of my hand and descend the staircase. When you slam the door behind you, it squashes the garden that we almost let grow. Revised placard text for The Portrait of Abigail Mildren, 1993, Herndon, Virginia, property of the Mildren Family Gallery. Abigail, the daughter of Hugo and Melanie Mildren, and the cousin to her adopted brother, Maverick Mildren, is pictured alone. She is the only Mildred artist to abstain from marriage as part of a vow taken on her 25th birthday and which the prior curator, Mrs. Henrietta Mildred, took great issue with. Given that the artist took her vow with conviction, it seems odd that blue sadness would dominate the portrait. Notice the sapphire ripples in her frown lines, the dark navy tears that cover her cheeks. Could it be, perhaps, that Henrietta made certain rehabilitations? Those that show Abigail as Henrietta saw her, Sad, lonely, unworthy of happiness? The gallery shall never know, for Abigail has since estranged herself from the Mildred family. I make my way back into the sitting room alone, and I collapse on the sofa. Feeling a little bit Abigail, says Suze, repeating the joke that once spread through your family, as if blue grief that none of you show was something to laugh about. Believe me, I've been there. We all have at some point. She picks up a sandwich and shoves it into my hand. She watches me eat as she sips her tea. I nibble on the miniature ham and cheese triangle. How did you hide it? I didn't, she says. Why do you think Henrietta hated me so much? She would die all over again if she knew I were in charge now. I inspect her skin. There are no scars of blue, no pockets of sadness. Wrinkled cream flows from her fingers to her neck. And not the cream of worry, but the cream of contentment. A product of years worth of blending and refining, of honing her palette to a balanced spectrum. One in which each of her colours is welcome, but none so violent they burn out the rest. I wish he could be like you. But he can, says Suze. Alfie, my dear, ours is a family of visceral emotions. Maverick needs to learn how to let himself out. Not just the red and not just the green. Once he can accept that the other colours have a place, he can learn to control them. I sigh and set my half-eaten sandwich on the table. You make it sound so easy. Suze just laughs. It can be, she says. All you need to do is show him. Show him, I say. I'm no artist. 
Suze leans all the way over to my cushion. She dramatically cocks one of her over-penciled eyebrows. What do you plan to do with all his colours? Hide them forever? She slowly shakes her head. My dear, you can use them. It may not be pretty and it may take some time, but Mav needs to see that his emotions are valid, that all of them together make you both something special. But Mav's supposed to guide me, the brush on the canvas. Traditionally, yes, Suze winks at me and smiles. Every other Mildred artist has painted their own portrait, but in this case, I think we can make an exception. I chew on my lip, unsure what to do. Suze seems to notice. Here, take this, she says, and reaches for my cheek, pinching it with all the compassion I can hold. It's something I wish Henrietta had given me. It'll help you to see the best in what you already have, if you're brave enough to reveal it. I feel the smear of colour that oozes from her fingers. Pink, mixed with red, mixed with cotton candy fuchsia that clings to the surface of my skin like oil. She gives me a colour that I've never felt before, one that you've never had the power to share. And my canvas isn't sure what to do, how to act. The violet is alive, pulsing with potential. Now get out of here, she says, patting me gently. And don't forget the frame. We don't see each other much over the next few days. You are as normal, drowning in yourself. I am in the basement, drowning as well, but this time not in you. I wade through the sketches that I've practiced over the years. I study the rules that you've taught me that we need. Then, I crumple those up and throw them in the trash can. And I start something new. On the first day, I stare at the frame on the wall, the carved cedar treasure that we bought home from Susanna's. On the second day, I trace the wooden planks with my fingers, memorizing the lines that will one day define us. On the third day, I lay my hands bare in the center. I press on the canvas, and I let you all out. Every searing touch of red, every ember of gold, every muted, not good enough drop of tainted yellow, the emerald smiles that give me false hope and the deep blue despair that always comes after. I swirl these colors that you've given me to hold and I give them back to you with some of my own, some that I've created and some that I've discovered. And under them all, a streak of violet burns, the violet of love, a messy, tangled thing. Later that evening, you come downstairs and you find me in the basement. Alfie, you say, what, what are you doing? Rather than answer, I hold out my hand. I wait for you to wrap your fingers in my own, and with the hint of a smile, I lead you to our portrait frame, both of us shaking, slick with sweat, both of us scared to see what we'll create. With my palm in the flurry of colours on the wall, I allow you to guide me, your brush to my canvas, as it should always have been. There are deep, wide strokes. There are colours that bleed. There are tears and emotions we've never acknowledged. And for the first time in seven long years, I don't care. And I hope, in time, neither will you. When we're done, I lean back and I stare at our portrait. The me that I see is raw and pure and covered in all the scars that I've earned, from the red fire lust and the golden anger blade and the indigo sadness that blooms when we fight. That's us, you say, as you let your shoulders sag. Not in a good way, but not like before, when your colours were stifled. Now, they run free. Now, your whole family will see us as we are. That's us, I say, holding your hand. I smile, and know that I wouldn't change a thing. Original placard text for The Portrait of Maverick and Alfie Mildren, 2003 Fredericksburg, Virginia, property of the Mildren Family Gallery. Maverick and Alfie are pictured in their home on the eve of their seventh wedding anniversary. These are two bold, daring artists. The maelstrom of colours is a sign of their honesty, an acceptance of their flaws. They are vulnerable, something much needed in these halls. Their portrait is unique in the hundred-year history of the Mildren Family Gallery, in being the only one to incorporate true violet. 
and by embracing their own chaos, they make it a masterpiece. And welcome back. That was The Museum of Living Colour by Ryan Cole. And despite years of reading slush in this castle, it's his first time for one of his own stories to appear at Escape Artist. That doesn't mean there's not plenty more to read if you enjoyed that, though. So check out his website at ryancolewrites.com. Emotions are never easy. Straightforward, simple to delineate and identify. Particularly as someone socialised as a male through the 90s and noughts, emotions were seen as lesser, a weakness to be overcome and expunged, rather than acknowledged and embraced. I distinctly remember being told, plainly and bluntly, by a leader, that scouts don't cry, and there's a strain of particularly masculine thinking that still persists and pesters us today, that believes the ultimate debating position is to be utterly logical and devoid of emotion. The irony there is, of course, that emotions are inescapable, intrinsically human, and to pretend you are not prey to them is in fact to be deliberately ignorant of them, and thus completely subject to them. You need to acknowledge them, to account for them. But that's still seeding the premise, of course, that emotions are something to be compensated for, something to be controlled and corralled, and let me tell you friends, as my therapist is trying to tell me, that there is no happy destination at the end of that path. Emotions are who we are. What we feel is what we do, what motivates and drives us, what shapes our thoughts and our responses. You can no more consider yourself without your emotions than you can consider a town without its people. Everything in you is in service to fulfilling your emotional needs. We can't control that chaos and turn it into conformity. Instead of clinging to the shoreline as the waves of our emotional sea batter us, we need to learn to sail on the waters, navigate the storms and ride the swells and tides. We are who we are, and better to learn to steer it and lean into our winds than try to fight it and flounder on the rocks. So thank you, Ryan, for the honest appraisal of what love is, what life is, what it is to feel and to be and to share a journey with others. That was our show for this week. On behalf of everyone at Podcastle, your co-editors Shingai Enjoro Kagunda and Eleanor Arwood, assistant editor Caitlin Zivanovich, audio engineers Devin Martin and Eric Valdez, and our many wonderful first readers, Andrew Cahoe, Craig Jackson, Amalia Harrington, Julia Pat, Kieran Corsini, Ryan Cole, Sarah S. Messenger, Shrikripa Krishna Prasad, Tarva Nova, Tierney Bailey, Zeev Witties, and myself, Matt Dovey. Thank you for letting us share another story with you. The Legal Bit. Podcastle is part of the Escape Artist Foundation, a 501c3 non-profit, and this episode is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. That means you can share it, and please do, but you cannot sell it and you cannot change it. If you want specifics, check creativecommons.org. Our music is by Shiva in Exile. Everything we do on Podcastle is 100% donor funded. And if you'd like to support what we and the rest of EA do, please join us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash EA Podcasts. Prefer another method? There's details for supporting us via Twitch, Amazon Prime, Ko-fi and PayPal on escapeartist.net. We'll be back next Tuesday with another fantastic tale. In the meantime, you might care to check out our sister podcasts, Escape Pod for Science Fiction, Pseudopod for Horror, Cast of Wonders for YA Speculative Fiction, and Cats Cast for Speculative Cat Stories. If your heart belongs to us though, we'll see you next week. Be safe and be kind.